dioxide emission from the main use of this fossil fuel would be the most important, which is very puzzling for as a scientist, of course, to think about this. Well, don't you think that there's a part of humanity, a genuine uh, good side of humanity, that people, most people of every tradition, of every walk of life, of every profession, really want to have the environment be clean, and they don't necessarily associate that which they can't control with what's happening to the planet. In other words, it's easier to focus on what we can do to help, you know, clean the air and clean the waters. Like I had read online that there's some type of, not to change the subject, but I had read that the oceans are becoming so acidic that a lot of the fish and marine life are getting killed. And nobody, uh, nobody's explained to me if the oceans are becoming acidic, why are they becoming acidic and what causes that? Well, some people say, well, it's be- it has something to do with CO2 or carbon. I don't know if you want to respond to that. Or- yes, I do, because okay. uh, I have indeed uh, myself and uh, David Legates have done a lot of thinking into this question. The, the whole story there is indeed, I would say, half-truth that you're hearing. Th- there is no doubt that if we human emit this carbon dioxide, this carbon dioxide, will some of it will stay in the atmosphere, of course, but we know also quite a lot of it actually will go into the ocean. And then once, you, once it goes into the ocean, of course, because this carbon dioxide will change the natural cycling of the what they call the carbonate and the bicarbonate cycles in, in the uh, biogeochemical uh, 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 changes in the ocean, that you will change the pH of the ocean which is a measure of the acidity of the ocean. Correct. And there is no doubt that you, when you do that, you will actually uh, make the ocean more acidic. There is also no doubt about that. I have, wait, wait, before... The, the, before question, the question then is that what does it do to the, to the system? Well, wait, wait, before we get to the question of what, what it does to the system, I have one other question for you regarding the ocean and the acidity of the ocean because isn't it, could it also be true that the hundreds and thousands of underwater volcanoes, because volcanism impacts climate too, could they acidify the ocean? Oh, sure thing, of course. I mean, this is why, actually, the, if you talk about, as we all know that uh, basically 50% of the volume of, of, the, of the ocean is below, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 meters, right? So we have only very little amount of water actually at the, at the surface. And the bottom part is no doubt are highly complex, but we also know uh, as a fact that those bottom waters are extremely acidic, by the way. So this is why no, not many shell life could be sustained there if, if the water is extremely deep. And, and this is why it's a puzzle. The question, again, let's go back to the question of when you change the acidity of the ocean, what, what will uh, uh, the ocean respond? How does it respond? The typical uh, way in which the, I would say the, the, the alarmist or the scary story coming out from even scientists themselves was to say that, well, this is going to kill all the marine life. Essentially, the idea is that then you make the ocean more acidic, then the calcium carbonate would not be able to form. So, so that calcium carbonate we know is the, is the material that is uh, essentially chalk, right? That's making up the, the shells, uh, bodies and everything, right? And, and if you don't have that, of course, the, the, the marine life will be harmed. But uh, I guess the surprising fact that has been learned actually as recent as only result, result that came out last year or so is that instead of making the shelf uh, thinner and, and weak and, of course, total destruction, the shell actually would actually grow better. This is a total shock, uh, shocking result that just came out actually about a year or so. And the reason why that you have such a strong contradictory result is because in the old experiment that we have heard of, all this old experiment that has been talking about, you know, how if you change the acidity of the ocean, you will, you will make the shell form less, is because instead of doing the proper experiment, by letting the, the carbon dioxide in the air and then bubble through the whole system, those people have cheated in their experiment. They have essentially just add weak hydrochloric acid to the water directly itself to study the response of the, ocean, uh, the marine system which is really a shock, a total shock, actually. And in fact, the, the authors that produced this paper are, 
uh, immediately being, you know, uh, treated as somebody that is, uh, is extremely bad by even coming out with such a uh, brilliant, I think, scientific results that, of course, that can be repeated by anyone who's studying them carefully. And the whole idea there is, of course, that don't forget that CO2 is also what I call food for marine life. Okay, we know that CO2 is food for plant life. There's no doubt about that. But CO2 is also food for marine life. There's no doubt about it because the plants, are essentially because of the ocean, because of the buffer, the, the layers, the, the processes, the biogeochemical cycling in the ocean that actually sort of prevented them from taking in more of this carbon, they really, really love carbon. They are actually starving from, from not having enough carbon. And this is why this contradi uh, contradictory result could come out in so late in the game. Because imagine everybody is rushing now in December to try to go to this city called Copenhagen to try to sign the treaty to control the carbon dioxide emission from every industrial use of the, the, the uh, all the good stuff that we use, right? The fossil fuel. And then all of a sudden you have such a result that shows such a directly opposite results. And, and, and it's very, very scary actually to think about how actually science is actually being, uh, second, I guess, being treated as a, a secondary, uh, a subject instead of the primary, uh, subject that should inform all these public policies and, and all these uh, governments and all these lawmakers. Well, they're not getting the right information. That's the point. Could you stand by for one moment? We actually have David Legates on from the University of Delaware, who's a climatologist with a specialty in climatology related to water. But there, there's a way that you say it, David. Tell us about yourself. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a hydroclimatologist, and so I'm really interested in the water cycle, particularly how it relates to evaporation and precipitation and how essentially changing environments change water distributions, particularly on the planet. We will come back to you, Willie. We have not left the subject. The question then is, what is this thing about rising sea levels? Are the sea levels rising? What does that have to do with? There's all these elements on the wheel of the subject. What is this about rising sea levels and where does it come from? Well, sea level rise occurs from a number of processes. I mean, historically, if we look at it, sea level was very low at the end of the last ice age and has since increased as the ice is melted. Now, sea level rises for two reasons. One is the thermal expansion of seawater. That is, as seawater warms, it, it expands. And so with a warmer climate, as we've had over the last oh, 12 to 20,000 years, the sea level that we've had has expanded in size and therefore has risen that direct dimension. And the second part of it is with the melting of, uh, of various ice. So as we had a lot of ice stored on the surface in glaciers, and in ice caps and things like that, we stored a lot of water that way, which was out of the oceans. Now, what with the melt that took place with the end of the last glacial period, all that water winds up in the oceans, and so we've seen a long-term rise in sea level. Now, that, that rise in sea level has been continuing, as I said, for about 20,000 years or so due to the, the end of the last ice age. So we've seen rising sea levels take place as a direct result of a warmer climate that isn't necessarily a warmer climate due to human action. Human actions. I have a I have a question related to that. I in in my last interview with Bob Felix, he said that, and it was verified that glaciers are actually growing. That the very opposite of what we're being told is true. That they're growing. So if there's many many more thousands of glaciers, mammoth glaciers that are growing, could that contribute to the sea rising in some way or no? Well, no. Essentially, there there are glaciers that are growing. There are glaciers that are, are de depleting. The, the glacier dynamics is, is really complicated. It's not just simply one of temperature rises, therefore snow melts and ice melts, and hence you get runoff into the oceans. Uh, glacial dynamics is really a combination of factors between rise between changes in temperature and changes in precipitation. In a sense, you can get a depleting snowpack simply because temperature remains constant, but the actual snowfall decreases. That's exactly what's happening in Mount Kilimanjaro. There's been a lot of uh, airplay on the fact that the snows of Kilimanjaro are disappearing, and when you actually look at the temperatures of the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, you see there's virtually no change in temperature whatsoever at that location. What's really happening is we've seen a shift from what was once a wetter climate that produced more snowfall to now a drier climate in that region, which actually produces less snowfall. 
the glacier dynamics are a lot more complicated, and as a result, sea level dynamics are a lot more complicated than just simply saying 